Welcome to this lecture. I have titled this lecture Narrative Devices in Sundar Ramasamy's Reflowering. So let's take a good look at some of the narrative devices at play in this particular narrative. Now I want to pick up on this idea of the flashbacks. Uh, we have a a uh, sizable um, extended flashback at the beginning of this story. So let's unpack this uh, particular flashback because this is very important as it captures the first crisis between the owner of the shop and the central character Ravata. So the very first crisis is itself presented to the readers as a flashback by the narrator of the story. And I want to explore the kind of impact it creates on the reader. And at the immediate first level, what does it do? It takes the readers one step back from the current point in the narrative. So the timeline shifts uh, through this uh, flashback narrative. Now, this is how the flashback is introduced. Uh, the narrator, the boy, climbed into the waiting buggy and um, he thinks these thoughts. As I climbed the waiting buggy, I thought that we could not manage the Onam festival sales without Ravata. And as he travels in the buggy, in the horse cart, um, in the horse carriage, he goes back in time to that particular evening when there was this clash between Ravata and his father. And he captures the entire uh, battle of uh, egos, so to speak, um, with uh, the dialogues and all the uh, comments precisely in his narrative. And uh, a word about the narrator again, because we need to remember that this narrator is a young child, the boy, the son of the shop um, keeper, he is young, yet he is highly responsible and he is mature in his perspectives. And if you notice the kind of thinking, the thought process that he has, it shows us that they are very, very lucid, logical and rational. Now, this um, is um, the extract that I want to uh, look briefly before I go into an analysis of the narrative time in flashbacks. That year, the sales during Onum were very good. Ravata was in his element. With great elan, he supervised the shop boys who scurried around him. He looked like Abhimanyu in the Mahabharata, fighting a, uh, fighting while a battalion single-handed. So uh, this is the um, extract which follows the flashback and uh, this uh, extract captures in brief uh, the behavior of Ravata as soon as the problem was sorted and his be behavior during the Onam sales. And and here I am interested in the um, figurative language. Uh, we can see that Rauta is compared to Abhimanyu. We have a simile which is taken from the Mahabharata. And it's a very, very interesting simile because Abhimanyu is a character who is uh, courageous, yet he is also innocent and naive in certain respects. And he ultimately loses the battle uh, and he loses his life as well. And it's interesting to see that Rauta is compared to this particular character in Abhimanyu. And I would um, suggest that this particular figurative language um, is a double edged, um, uh, is a double edged comparison. And we have a source in the religious epic, the Hindu religious epic. Okay, now I want to get back to uh, narrative time. So we have two levels of time in a particular narrative or fiction. The first is the story time. The first point that I have put on the slide is the story time and the other is the discourse time. And uh, we need to clearly understand what is the difference between these two times to get a good grasp on flashbacks and um, uh, foreshadowings. Okay, so there is a connection between these two times and the concepts of foreshadowing and flashbacks. Okay, so what is um, story time and what is discourse time? Story time is the time experienced by the characters. Okay, the characters experience time one by one, by one event after another event um, logically um, in, in relation to time. And discourse time is the time experienced by the readers. And uh, please note that there is a difference between these two uh, time um, references. 
and let's um, uh, look at these concepts more closely. Okay. Generally, when we understand a story, um, we understand them in terms of the events and events happen according to uh, the logic of time and causation. One thing causes another and things happen in time. But an author can deliberately rearrange the events disregarding the time in which they have happened for particular purposes. So, the events can be rearranged in a narrative according to the wishes of the author and they need not follow the time of the story time. Okay? So, um, in a narrative an author can uh, give information, advance information about certain uh, events that are going to happen in a narrative for dramatic effect and also the author can suppress information information about what is going to happen in the story deliberately for dramatic effect. So, this is the choice of the author who is creating the story world and he or she does that in order to create a particular effect on the readers. So, the story time and the discourse time are all factors which are involved in the uh, authorial decision of the writer who arranges uh, events in a particular way to create the maximum impact. He can give you the events as they happen one after the other. First this happened, second this happened, third this happened, this was the final uh, thing to happen. That is the story time and sometimes he can meddle with the arrangement of events. He can um, put things you know um, willy nilly um, according to his own or her own logic in order to create the maximum dramatic impact on the reader so that they get the maximum pleasure out of it. Okay. So, uh, I am going to go back to this uh, critic narrative, critic called Gerard Jeanette to talk about this temporal disparity, temporal differences in narrative. So, uh, he calls um, these uh, temporal disparities by these terms analepsis and prolepsis. Now, first let us uh, take a look at uh, analepsis. What is the meaning of analepsis? Analepsis tells or shows what has happened in the past with respect to the present. So, what has happened in the past with respect to the present is a, a sort of a flashback. It is as if the story is going back in time, the story is rewinding, um, is going back, uh, it is tracing the tracks, um, it is what somebody is going back uh, backwards in the route to a particular point in the story to tell the readers about uh, something important that has happened. So, that is analepsis, I uh, hope that is um, that point is clear. So, the past in relation to the present is analepsis and that is like a, a rewinding of the narrative. And this is what happens in the first crisis in uh, reflowering. If you remember the story, it begins in the house of Ambi when uh, you know the family gets up, the father is getting ready to leave for work and then uh, the father says go get uh, Ravata from his home and the boy gets onto the buggy, he travels towards the house and then he goes back in time to that particular clash between his father and Ravata and he captures the entire episode. Uh, almost verbatim uh, with some um, commentary by him as well. So, that uh, analepsis is there in reflowering. Let us look at prolepsis. So, what exactly is prolepsis? Prolepsis is um, what happens in the future with respect to now in the story. So, the now is the present and uh, uh, in the present you will get a hint of what is going to happen in the past, in the I am sorry in the future. So, uh, you get a sense of what is going to happen in the future now that is prolapsis. It is like fast forwarding the story, you are going to uh, get a sense of the future, a premonition of the future now that is fast forwarding of the story and that is uh, foreshadowing. Uh, that concept is related to this idea of foreshadowing that happens in the story. Why do the authors employ these uh, narrative uh, devices in relation to time such as the flashback or the foreshadowing? What is the point of the uh, usage of such devices in the story. Firstly, 
it gets the attention of the readers. We kind of tend to take a moment out and say, oh, oh my God, this is going back in um, the narrative point of time. Oh, this is kind of a hint of things to come. So such um, decisions, such authorial decisions gets the attention of the readers who pay greater attention to the structure of the story, structure of the plot trajectory plot pathway and again uh, suspense curiosity and surprise are involved in all these narrative devices and ultimately what's the point of all these elements why do we enjoy the suspense why do we enjoy the curiosity why do we like surprises because that is the reading pleasure that is the satisfaction that we get out of reading fiction ultimately it's about enjoyment and that enjoyment comes from the way the story is structured and these interesting narrative devices help the authors achieve such an effect so um, again, uh, we need to um, get this point reinforced that there is an element of surprise involved in flashback and foreshadowing and that element of surprise is crucial to the success of a story. Um, sometimes the story and how um, the story doesn't uh, make the greatest impact on a reader, but how that story is narrated makes the greatest impact on a reader. So let's go back to reflowering. Um, this is the extract that I want to uh, look closely uh, because this particular extract um, finishes off that episode, that episode about the crisis between the shop owner and Ravata. When the shop closed in the evening, Ravata would usually look in the direction of my father and take permission to leave. So that's the usual ritual. He will look in the direction of my father and he would take permission to leave. This particular evening, he did not take permission. This particular even, evening, he doesn't do that. Uh, and this particular extract is part of the flashback episode, um, the episode in the past embedded in the present time. Um, there are certain elements which are uh, interesting in terms of the content of that particular extract. And the first one is Ravata sightlessly looking in the direction of power. Uh, we got to remember that Ravata is blind. He's just symbolically looking at uh, his boss, his employer, his owner. And um, that looking uh, without really seeing is, uh, is his subjection, uh, his uh, subservience to the authority in the uh, shop. And um, that particular evening, if you go back to that extract, that particular evening, that bond, that employer-employee bond is uh, visionlessly broken um, in, some, uh, in, in, in some respects. He doesn't look that way uh, to get that um, you know, symbolic permission to leave the shop uh, in order to come back again the next day. So that bond is broken between Ravata and the shop owner. And this particular episode or this particular paragraph brings a shock closure to that crisis in the uh, story in the first uh, third of it. So he doesn't take permission which means he has nothing more to say to this owner and he's going to go away as if permanently. So that is the um, shock closure to that particular crisis in the story. So um, the flashback performs a lot of um, functions in the story and that abrupt break in ritual creates an impact on the reader. It just gives that first jarring uh, motion to the story um, in terms of the reader's uh, effect or the, re the impact on the readers. Once we have this abrupt break, we, we have that in our mind as readers and um, we now see Ambi, um, the boy, go into the house of Ravata and we are slightly apprehensive as to what would happen because that has been the abrupt break the other day. Everybody has witnessed that uh, clash between the owner and Ravata and we are slightly apprehensive as to how Ravata would behave. So uh, we might uh, think that he might behave slightly roughly to the boy uh, who is the son of the shop owner but that doesn't happen at all. It's the total opposite that's what happens to Ambi. He's warmly welcomed uh, by uh, Ravata who sits as a lord in the house. He's not um, affected by the crisis.
basis he's not affected by the battle that he had uh, uh, with um, the owner he sits uh, in the center of his um, home like a lord and he welcomes Ambi he wants to know the a kind of uh, Vaishti the kind of waist cloth that he's wearing and he kind of touches his face to get um, a sense of his uh, person and things like that and uh, he inquires about um, the boy's mother so he's totally at ease there is equanimity in Ravata and that uh, shift in emotion is very very interesting um, in terms of the effect of the story on the readers and as soon as he makes a comment about the uh, health of um, uh, Amma and the medicine that she is supposed to take and things like that the boy says Amma wants me to take you to the shop she wants me to tell you that she is very sorry if Appa has said anything to hurt you you're not to misunderstand him she says please don't turn down her request so the boy as I said he's very strategic uh, he knows when to make this request at what particular moment in the conversation between Ravata and uh, Ambi so he asks at the opportune moment and says can you please come because Amma wants you to come and she's apologizing uh, to you on the behalf of Appa and immediately Ravata accepts and says okay let's get uh, back to the shop and so it's again another kind of shock or surprise there because um, we have been uh, through that episode dialogue by dialogue um, in the words of Ambi and after that particular uh, harsh exchange when he says you don't want to um, continue our relationship and he says that to the father um, upper and he says that sarcastically you, you need to also keep in mind the tone in which Ravata asks that question so after that uh, harsh exchange uh, almost brutal exchange between the uh, owner and Ravata he, his sudden change of mind is another pleasant surprise and then things become normal and that's when uh, we have this particular extract which I read before in terms of the metaphor of um, uh, Abhimanyu so uh, this is what happens events are kind of a bridge there uh, and he works really well there's no hard feeling whatsoever on the part of Ravata and there's no mention of the clothes episode which brought that crisis um, into the shop and he worked with great elan he he's really happy pleased and he supervises the entire shop and he um, you know fights the battle with the customers in order to meet their demands and uh, make the bills as uh, quickly as possible um, so everything is all uh, you know um, hunky dory in, in this co particular context so there is a upward and the downward there's a high and a low in terms of the mood swings of Ravata as well as in terms of the narrative itself uh, it, it seems to go to a particular high and then come down or plunge deeply in terms of its emotional journey okay so this is um, the impact on Ravata as soon as Ambi makes that request please come back to the shop um, because Amma wants you to so Rahul's face uh, brightened visibly the face brightens he raised his hands in salute Amma you are a great woman he called out get up let's go to the shop at once he's very brisk uh, he wants to get into action right away and as I said there's no further mention of the clothes episode at all in the narrative so um, this salute uh, reminds us of the um, you know that um, visionless look in the direction of the shop owner and uh, he seems to kind of salute the woman who has become the mediator between the two men so she is thanked there symbolically and um, things are um, back in place now let's look at this particular concept of foreshadowing we have uh, looked at flashbacks and now we are going to look at pro um, prolepsis foreshadowing and there's a minor foreshadowing minor but uh, intensive foreshadowing of things that are going to happen in the story and this is the foreshadowing that is uh, referred to in the story Appa says a time will come when you will be cut down to size when he makes this remark he's terribly displeased he's hurt by the behavior of Ravata who goes and works briefly for a rival clothes shop run by the Chetir and he does this right after Appa has helped him financially massively uh, he pays the debts on his house and he saves the house but despite that he goes back to work for the Chetir who is a rival cloth merchant 
and affected by that he makes that remark a time will come when you will be cut down to size and Rautha says please don't say such things I uh, come work for me and I'll pay your debts the Chetia said and I lost my head uh, he said I'll clear all your debts and I had to go and work for him Appa only repeated a time will come when you will be cut down to size and um, this foreshadowing is realized almost immediately in the story because right after this particular um, exchange where he, um, there's a um, hint of the threat that's going to come to Rautha it's, it's realized quite soon after if you look at the story. So there is an implicit threat as I said and a hidden tragedy is also there in that foreshadowing of events to come and he's going to cut down and he's going to be cut down to size and what's the meaning of that phrase it literally means to show someone that they are not as clever or or as important as they think so that's the meaning of that phrase cut down to size and in the context of Ravuta it's not just about destroying his ego it's about destroying his livelihood livelihood as well so it's more vital uh, in relation to Ravuta's um, context so to everyone's surprise as I said this happens quite quickly the threat is realized very very soon uh, to everyone's surprise, events began to unfold that made it look as if Appa was going to be right after all. When he returned from Bombay that year, after seeing his wholesalers, he brought back a small machine and showed it to Amma. This can do calculations, he said. A machine? It can. So, um, Appa who makes the threat, he makes sure that th that, that threat is uh, realized because when he goes to Bombay, he gets this machine that can do the calculation. Look at the way he says simply the facts. He just states the facts and he makes no comment whatsoever about the impact of the machine on Ravata's mind and um, Ravata's livelihood. So um, he says, um, the narrator says to everyone's surprise, he says to everyone's surprise, uh, because our readers have been also anticipating such a surprise because they have been um, given that hint, that cue that something is going to happen and it's not a pleasant surprise for uh, many of them who might sympathize with Ravata. In fact, the surprise is really a reversal of fortune because Ravata is at the height of his fortunes and with the arrival of the machine, his fortune is reversed. The wheel does come uh, another circle when uh, he reaches the lowest of the low in terms of the uh, luck he has been having. So, as I said, the father makes no comment in relation to Ravata about the impact of the machine. And he just is very, very factual that he states the facts and the machine can do calculations and he shows, uh, and he shows this to his wife um, because if you remember the beginning, one of the beginning exchanges with his wife, his, uh, the wife asks, is Ravata the only person in this entire world who can do the sums quite quickly? So uh, it's as if the, he is um, kind of responding to that comment by bringing her this particular gadget which can do the work of Ravata as efficiently and um, as quickly as uh, the old man would do. And again, there's, as I said, no, uh, not a reference, a single reference to the impact on Ravata uh, if because of this machine. What is the function of the foreshadowing in terms of the narrative structure of reflowering? That insidious threat that's there in the foreshadowing is like the hook, um, it's like the fishing hook that will capture the attention of the readers. Um, they will be more anxious as they read the uh, text or the story uh, very closely and see what's going to happen to this old man, this blind old man. And as I said, the anticipation of the readers is, um, is kind of um, intensified through that foreshadowing and it becomes a lure, an attraction for the readers. And reading pleasure is heightened through such a narrative device. Okay, so what is the tragedy? Um, the tragedy that is realized uh, in uh, foreshadowing is the emotional and the physical collapse of Ravata, this old man, this blind old man who cannot take the onslaught um, of the machine which can work wonders in anybody's hands. 
and that is the tragedy and what is the comedy because we we don't end with a tragedy in the story we end at a uh, we end with a comedy everything is back to normal things are resolved and how does that happen it happens through the recovery of uh, ravuta we, it happens with the reflowering of ravuta spirit who realizes the potential of his memory and the value of that memory for the benefit of the running of the shop the cloth shop so um, it's a tragic um, um, it is a tragedy followed by a comedy. So, we have the crisis, uh, the big crisis, the ultimate crisis which is revolved in order to reach a comic effect at the end of the story. Comedy in the sense that things are back to normal, it ends on a positive note, not comedy as in ha ha ha, it is funny. That is not the comedy that I am talking about, I am talking about the happy state that is achieved by the members of the universe um, uh, of, of this particular story. Now, as I said. Um, the bouncing back of Ravata, the bouncing back from the tra uh, tragic level has again a surprise element because we do not anticipate that as readers we do not anticipate that. The foreshadowing that is there that hints only at the uh, tragedy that is going to befall Ravata. It does not uh, mention the happy ending that he is going to get in which he is promoted, in which he ra uh, raises to a he raises himself to a higher level that is not referred to in the foreshadowing. The foreshadowing only talks about the cutting down to size of Ravata's ego. In fact, when we see the end of the story, his ego is doubly, uh, trebly increased uh, because he becomes the manager, uh, the supervisor of the entire store and even the owner of the store um, is, like a, uh, is like a child um, in, his, uh, in the hands of Ravata because he just follows all the orders, all the suggestions, all the directions of Ravata at the end of the story. So, even the owner is managed uh, by this particular old man. So, there is a big rise for him at the end of the story and that is again a surprise element brought about by the narrative structure of this particular story. Okay, let us see how that happens um, uh, in the story. So, his voice was slow, hesitant, his body looked thinner, Appa had stopped asking him to do the bills. So, this is the tragic part, um, this is the part that um, shows us the collapse, but right after this we can see the uh, narrative rise again, uh, you know that is the upward movement of this particular story. One afternoon it was a busy time in the shop, Murugan had a pile of cut pieces with him, I was working out the cost, suddenly Ravata interrupted him, what did you say was the price of Poplin? And that is the moment in the story when Rauta gets back on his horse, he, when Rauta gets back on track to the recovery of his uh, spirit, that is when Rauta starts to reflower, his spirit starts to bloom again because that, uh, in that question um, on the part of Rauta already has told him the answer because he knows that Murugan is wrong in terms of the price of that particular fabric and he knows what is the right price for that and he knows that with that answer he can decimate the entire um, set of odds against him in that particular store. So, we can see the you know the fall of Rauta and again we can see the point in which he starts to rise again in the estimation of not only the uh, shop assistants, but also the entire uh, shop um, which includes the shop owner, the boy, Gomadi and everybody. How do we see all this? How do we see all these narrative devices, uh, prolepsis, analepsis, you know um, and, and metaphors, figurative language and all these, how do we assess this in terms of the impact of a story? Okay, there are two interests in terms of narrative structure for a reader. The first one is the cognitive interest and the second was the emotional interest. The cognitive interest is one whereby the cognition, the, the intellectual, the thinking side of the human brain is engaged. Okay? So, the narrative structure with its um, ups and downs, with its flashbacks and flash forwards, with its foreshadowings and flashbacks. So, this captures the uh, cognitive interest of readers. And the emotional interest is the interest um, that we derive 
out of the sentiments um, and, the, and the bonds that are forged and broken between the characters. So, um, the emotional interest and the cognitive interest um, kind of um, keep the ball rolling, keep the uh, reader interested in a particular story. And I am drawing on the ideas of Walter Kinshich uh, in terms of this cognitive and emotional interest. So, the cognitive interest as I said is dependent on the discourse structure, the structure of the narrator, okay, how the author has arranged events and things in a particular narrative. What is the choice he has made in terms of the figurative language? Does he decide to have some flashbacks? Does he or she decide to have some flash forwards or foreshadowings? So, that is the discourse structure and our cognitive interest depends on this particular discourse structure. And the emotional interest as I said is um, dependent on or is associated um, in relation with the emotions or sentiments of the characters, the nature of events and the impact on the lives of the characters. So, in in um, in sum, these two the emotional interest and the cognitive interest are responsible for the success of a particular short story. And um, critics suggest that only if the cognitive uh, interest is high, uh, the um, emotional impact will also be proportionately high on the minds of the readers. So, the structure decides, the effective structure divides the, um, decides the attention um, level as well as the emotional dividends on the part of the uh, readers. Thank you very much for listening. I will catch up with you in the next session. Mm -hmm.